Welcome to The Ride, Life, Work, and Wealth podcast with your host, Chris Durow. Years ago, Chris was a firefighter and a paramedic and witnessed many people not getting another tomorrow, and it shaped who he is now as a financial strategist. Chris doesn't just help people plan for a secure tomorrow, he helps them plan for a better today. Chris lives and works in Burlington, Ontario, and runs an advisory practice named Three Hats Financial. Let's get to it. Welcome back to another episode of The Ride, Life, Work, and Wealth with Chris Duro of Three Hats Financial. I'm Patrice Sikora. Chris has a guest with him, David Rutherford. The plan is to explore responsible investing. Chris, this topic has grown more important to more investors recently. Tell us more about David and his experience with RI. Thanks, Patrice. Yeah, so today I'm really excited to be speaking about responsible investing. And why I'm so excited to get into this area is because it's becoming very popular. It's been gaining a lot of steam over the last couple of years. And now, especially with all the events happening around us now, it's even becoming more popular. Why I have just a, a personal interest in this is that my father was an environmental scientist when I was growing up. And he instilled these values on me way before there was even blue boxes or the general public even had an idea of what recycling was. So as a kid, I just remember jumping in the brown, uh, yes, brown <laughs> Ford Tempo and filling it up with all our recyclables and drying it to one central drop off uh, way before any of this recycling programs were even happening. I definitely have quite a few examples of that and just those values from being a kid around all of this. And then today, many investors, they just want a portfolio that's not just diversified. They also want one that's going to have an impact, whether that means just putting their money into companies that are making changes or avoiding the ones they perceive are doing harm. People aren't just, they're, they're starting to look more at what their money's in as opposed to here, take my money and just invest it. They, they want to know what's this going into. What I want to do for my listeners today is to uh, give them some more clarity on this and how they can become or get more information on becoming a responsible investor. And I'm excited to introduce David, who has over 30 years of experience in corporate government agency and nonprofit organizations. He's also currently the VP of ESG services at NEI Investments, and he's leading his team to help reinforce the company's leadership position in the rapidly changing investment landscape and in the very increasing competitive, responsible investing space. David, thank you very much for joining us today. I'm excited to have you on the show. Well, Chris, it's great to be here. Thanks so much. Now, I do have one quick question, personal question before we dive in here. I know that you used to earn a living as an abstract oil painter, cartoonist, writer, and journalist. So my question is, how the heck did you end up... <laughs> being where you are now when that's what you were doing before. I'm interested in that. Yeah, uh, it's it's a long story and probably um, too long to get on all the detail here. But, you know, I, I was a painter for 15 years and uh, my life kind of went south in uh, the late 90s. And I was living in a semi-abandoned building in downtown Toronto and hanging my food outside the window to keep it cool. And I decided this probably wasn't uh, a good life ending for me that I should think about doing something else. So I applied to go back to school. I went back to school in England and uh, I really wanted to study the impact of digital technology on human relationships. I thought there was really something there. This was about 20 years ago. And I really saw that there were some implications for, you know, increased digital usage and how we interact with each other. And some of them weren't always positive. And so I, I did that and then came back from England to Canada, got a job in the financial services field. I'd never worked in the field before as a writer researcher and got to know portfolio managers and how they made decisions and just to kind of work my way up in communications and executive strategy until 2016 when I, I came to NEI Investments to help the organization really reposition itself around responsible investing. NEI had always been the uh, leader in this field, but they were kind of doubling down in the space. They saw a lot of things coming that you talked about off the top in terms of the growth of this field and, and felt that really needed to think hard about who the organization was to maintain that leadership position. So I helped you know, work through that branding strategy and that executive communication strategy internally and externally. And then uh, last year, 
I was asked if I wanted to lead the ESG team, and the ESG team is basically NEI's responsible investment team. I'd gotten gotten to know them very well, obviously, because they are, they are critical to what we're all about at NEI. And so um, I said, yes, I would love to do that. And my mandate really is to just kind of help people and advisors and their investors understand uh, responsible investing, how it works, why we think it's important, and and really j- just to increase awareness of of the value that responsible investing can add to someone's portfolio and and to their life as well. So I'm really happy to be here talking about this today. Wow. No, thanks very much for filling us in on that. That definitely stuck out, especially the hanging the food out the window. <laughs> yeah. So that's quite the uh, quite the background. But no, thanks for filling us in on that. Let's get at it. Let's just start off with the first thing, which is, can you just give us a general idea or term of what responsible investing is because some people may think it's just about trees and plants and things like that very narrow focus but there's a whole heck of a lot more to it than just obviously just plants and the environment responsible investing broadly defined is an investment approach that incorporates what are called esg factors into the decision making investment decision making process and those factors e stands for environmental are the companies you're investing in good stewards of the environment what is their carbon footprint? Are they prone to environmentally uh, impactful accidents? Those kinds of things. So that's an environmental risk. S it stands for social factors or social risks. And that is, are companies managing their relationships with their own people, with their employees, with their customers, and with the communities that they're, that they're working in and living in? You know, are they paying their workers a fair, a fair wage? Are they not gouging their customers? Are they generally positive uh, contributors to the communities that they work in? And then G stands for governance, and that's essentially, you know, are you a well-run company? Do you have good uh, policies in place around things like diversity, things like executive compensation? Are your your operations fair and progressive? Essentially, are you you a good corporate citizen? And so these E, S, and G factors are simply elements that are incorporated into the investment decision making process alongside traditional factors like balance sheets and free cash flow and inventory and bricks and mortar and those kinds of things. So it, it's an additional layer of, of investment considerations. David Patrice here. Is this a new type of investment? Uh, it's not. Uh, responsible investing has been around probably since the late 1800s. It actually started out faith-based approaches and and primarily driven by the Quakers. So it was very much a social movement type of investing. It kind of, you know, was was quite niche for a long time. As we moved in through the 70s and the 80s, it became more about how companies were operating, you know, more like the G and also, you know, considered environmental factors into that process. And so we at NEI launched our first fund in the uh, mid 1980s. And we've launched several more since then. At that time, responsible investing was very much values driven. In other words, we had funds that excluded things like tobacco, excluded nuclear and excluded weapons. uh, And we still do, by the way. But over time, those ESG factors that I talked about started to become very material in the investment space. In other words, the components that are really driving the value of a company started to swing more in favor of ES and G than they did those traditional financial metrics that I talked about. And when the financial crisis hit, suddenly it became very evident that there were some companies that were not operating above board in a lot of ways, that there were companies that were undertaking practices like predatory lending, which all fell into the S and the G. And then there were companies that continued to impact negative to negatively in the environment. And what we were finding out at that time was that those types of risks were actually having an impact on the value of a company. Then it became clear that ESG wasn't simply a values-driven exercise, that it actually had real investment impact on the performance of companies. It's kind of grown in that dual way for the, for the last 10 years or so. I would say what's going on now is that I think that people are going to start to look to responsible investing. And I think that's part of the reason for this sudden rise in it that we've seen even even this year are going to look to responsible investing as essentially the right thing to do. 
So we've got a massive social upheaval going that was COVID inspired, that has been driven by uh, some of the Black Lives Matter movement in the US and also here in Canada. Times are changing and the world is shifting significantly. And I think a lot of investors are looking towards how our companies run and how they really run fairly. And that is right in the wheelhouse of responsible investing. So that, that answers one of, my, one of my questions where I was gonna ask you, do you see this keep increasing? Because we've just we've been seeing all kinds of dollars keep going into responsible investing. And obviously you just mentioned there that it is going to continue and that the popularity is going to keep increasing. Do you have any stats in regards to the, the amount of dollars that have gone into this in the last couple of years, just for an idea? Yeah, so I would say that globally responsible investment assets are about $30 trillion in, in investments. And in Canada, it's about $2 trillion. In Canada, it is, the, it is the fastest growing segment of the investment universe in Canada. But it's still a very small element, even despite how fast it's growing. So if you consider the assets held in Canadian mutual funds, for example, it's about $1.7 trillion. But Canadian responsible investment mutual funds are only about $12 billion. So there's incredible room to grow. But as I say, it's growing at an incredible clip. And right now, over half of all investments, both retail and in the institutional space like pension funds, over half of those investments are now in responsible mandates. So it's clearly on the rise. It's been coming for a while, but I think the elements we've seen in the last few, few months have really accelerated the uptake in responsible investing. And we've seen that in the sales of responsible funds in the first quarter of this year. How do you monitor companies to make sure that they are staying with RI guidelines? Yeah, how are they screened? There's a number of ways you can you can evaluate companies based on ESG factors. Uh, there are many data providers out there that get data from companies. Much of it's voluntary, as the, you know the regulations in the responsible investment space aren't nearly as deep as they are in the um, traditional investment space. They use that data to evaluate what factors are having a material impact on that company's operations. In other words, is a company's carbon footprint, how important is that? And if you're in the oil and gas sector, it's much more important than it is in say the fi financial services sector. So you can look at all that data. The trouble is there are a bunch of different data providers and they all look at the world a little differently. And so you can get a view of a company that's completely different depending on what data provider you're using. So a good example is Tesla. Everyone thinks that Tesla is would score very well on ESG and from the environmental perspective, it does. But it's not the best run company. From a governance perspective, there's there's lots of challenges there and you, and you see that with, with new companies. But these rating agencies may overweight environmental concerns more than they do governance concerns. What we do at NEI is we take all that data, but we don't use their evaluations. We have our own evaluation process where we use multiple data providers. And we also look at industry specifically because, as I said, the ESG factors within the oil and gas sector, for example, that are important are very different from the most important factors in, say, the financial services sector. And, and unless you're actually making that distinction on a sector by sector basis, you're not really doing justice to, to the companies. If a bank is scoring low on environmental factors, that's not nearly as important as making sure they're scoring well on protecting customer data and operating in an ethical fashion. So you need to consider the broad spectrum of data and, you, and to do it really well, you need to do your own analysis. And this isn't just an initial check, check sheet where you're gonna go through all those tests and then just leave the companies be. There's ongoing monitoring to make sure they're staying within the guidelines and that they're taking steps to pr provoke change as well if they do score low in yeah, some areas? Yeah, so what we use our, our scoring system for or our evaluation process for are a couple of things. One, it, should this company be included in our portfolios? In other words, is it a good, essentially a good company? And, and we use that evaluation process to decide who's good and who, who's bad and who could use some work. And it's the, one that, the ones that can use some work that are really interesting because that leads into another aspect of the work we do around corporate engagement. And that means we sit down with the management of companies and we highlight some of their ESG risks. These may be risks that they weren't even aware of. And the purpose of that isn't to call them out on something. It's actually to help them improve 
their ESG performance because we know that companies that have stronger ESG performance actually are better investments and more sustainable companies. And so we're, we're working together with these companies to help make them better investments on behalf of our, our investors. So we do monitor our companies regularly. We also monitor companies for headline risk. A company may look good in terms of the data we get, but there may be suddenly something that's happening with that company, either specifically or in the sector that it operates in, that may introduce a level of risk that the data doesn't show. And so we're continually monitoring companies for that to ensure that they still are good holdings for, for our funds and with that we don't need to intervene either through an engagement or divestment. Divestment is usually our, our root of last resort. We believe in holding companies and engaging them to help make them better. But some, in some cases, you simply have to divest of a company that, that is performing so poorly on ESG factors that you have to remove it from the portfolio. So that's a big difference then. In regards to that, compared to other funds and, and, and investments, you guys are actually involved with helping these companies change for the better. So the investor's money is, of course, going to get them a rate of return, but then their funds are also helping companies improve for the better for with an internal environment and everything else. So that, that's, that's a big difference between yeah, what a regular fund. Yeah, what I like to say about responsible investing is that it allows an investor to have an impact beyond returns. In other words, we are absolutely uh, aware and behind the need for all investors to grow their wealth by investing in these companies, and that is our goal. But we also recognize that they can have a positive impact uh, beyond investment by returns through some of the work that, that we do with companies. And so we we have engagements that are long and strategic, like an engagement we have with Suncor trying to help that company transition its operations so that it's actually viable in a low carbon economy because that's coming. And traditional oil and gas companies are going to have challenges if they're not thinking about how to transition into more diversified and renewable sources of energy. And then some of our engagements are very tactical in nature. For example, we had an engagement with Dollarama. We encouraged them to diversify their board, A, because it's important to have diversified boards, but B, it, you know, the metrics also show that companies that have more women on their boards actually perform better. And we ended up, in Dollarama's case, voting against their slate of board of directors. And they asked us why. We said, because you didn't put forth any women. The next year, they put forth two women on their board, and, and we supported them at, at the annual general meeting. So sometimes the engagements have very specific objectives like that, and sometimes they are taking place in the highest levels of the boardrooms of these companies trying to figure out what do we look like in 20, 30, 40 years. Well, wow, that's a great example, the Dollarama, just showing the difference there. So that's that's a great example. I want to touch on stereotyping of, of ethical funds that I had in the early years. Not as much now, but I do know that some people in the past would say, oh, yeah, okay, SRI or ESG or whatever mnemonic you want to use in regards to funds, they sound okay, but I've heard they don't have as great of returns as regular funds and their fees are higher. Has that changed, David, over the years? And how like how are they in comparison to say regular funds? Yeah, well, it, it's been a it's been a very persistent objection, and uh, I think in the past a few couple of decades ago that uh, that objection was valid in in many cases, but. The thing about responsible investing now versus then is that there, uh, there are a multitude of responsible investment approaches that are now applied. There was no such thing as corporate engagement back then. The evaluation process and the data that we're getting is now far more sophisticated. And so what we're doing with responsible investing is actually taking a much deeper look at a company's operations than whatever happened in the past. As a result, we're seeing that ESG factors are becoming more important in terms of company performance, and therefore we're seeing that the performance of RI or ESG focused funds has also improved significantly. There are a multitude of studies out there. Morningstar has, has a couple of good ones that have shown that even, even before this COVID crisis happened, responsible funds were, 58% of responsible funds were outperforming their peers over one, three, and five years, 63 over over one year. And then when you when you look at the really short term, we're seeing that 83% of Canadian responsible investment funds outperformed their average asset class return 
in Q1 of this year while, while we're at the height of the COVID crisis. People are realizing that the kinds of things you look at and the kind of things you consider when you invest responsibly actually matter to a company's performance. It's been proven in terms of data. I would also say that that objection has started to erode over time Mm -hmm. simply because it is being eclipsed by the demand from investors for these types of investment approaches. In other words, I'm not even talking about performance. I just want to make sure I'm invested in companies that are doing the right thing, that are operating with ESG factors in mind. Performance is important. It will always be important and it should be important. But in terms of ESG, it simply is not a factor. David, with COVID, as you mentioned, are pharmaceuticals coming under any closer scrutiny? They will. I mean, pharmaceuticals have been under close scrutiny already. I know certainly by us and by many others over issues around access to medicine. And you can see that's going to be a big issue coming out of COVID in terms of whoever develops a a vaccine and how that vaccine is, is distributed and how fairly it's distributed. So access to medicine was a big thing. The opioid crisis was a big thing in terms of pharma's involvement in that. I would say the issue with pharmaceuticals is the same issue we're going to see across the economy, and that is we're going to see fewer, stronger players come out of COVID, and those fewer, stronger players will have a lot more control over over the market and may, may themselves be able to dictate how they behave in the market able to dictate the, their terms on, on ESG factors. So I think it's going to be an interesting road for some of the big, big leaders in the space in pharma and especially technology. But there's no question with a vaccine on the horizon, everybody's going to be looking to see how pharma companies do in that. And will there be a winner who's tied to the vaccine or will be, you know, a winner who can produce that vaccine more cheaply? We're all interested in that stuff, but our primary view on pharmaceuticals is, are they fairly priced? Are they allowing fair access to their drugs? And are they not promoting drugs that can do harm to people? Back to pension managers. You'd mentioned that more pension managers are are putting ESG funds into their mix. What's the reason for that? Because I've heard that from a number of sources that there's more ESG funds in these these, uh, pension funds than there was before. There is, and you know, the pension funds have really led the responsible investment movement. They are far, far ahead of the retail space in terms of their incorporation of ESG factors into their investment decisions. Part of that is due to, you know, an early realization of the materiality, the impact that ESG factors can have on companies and that they are very closely tied to how that company is going to perform over the long term. And then we're also seeing pension funds now start to make very values-based decisions. And there are a lot of pension funds out there who are now divesting completely of any fossil fuel companies because their members are demanding that that they get out of the fossil fuel space and, and become fossil fuel-free investments. That's an easier trade for someone like uh, the pension fund in Norway to do because all their wealth was built on oil, so it's easy to diversify away from that. But we're now seeing the Harvard Pension Fund, I think the Princeton Pension Fund, uh, a number of other large pension funds that are starting to diversify or divest away from fossil fuels. We're not seeing that so much in Canada just because energy and fossil fuel companies are such an important part of our economy. But it is coming. Our view, as I said, is that we have to figure out a way to help the companies that are uh, in engaged in fossil fuels now, diversify their operations to transition away from that. And we just think that it's it's not feasible to walk away from fossil fuels because it's it's kind of an asymmetrical trade. You can feel good, okay, I, I'm not investing in any fossil fuels, but I'm still driving a car, I'm still heating my home. And, and so we think it's more important, more practical, and ultimately more responsible to work with these companies to help them diversify into true renewable energy companies. That way, we not only protect the the value of those companies, we also protect the economy of places like Alberta, where people are so dependent on these companies for employment. We have no interest in, you know, ruining the economy of Alberta just so that we can all be fossil fuel free. We think it's a process. It's going to take time. It's moving in the right direction. Some pension funds are are walking away, but others others totally get that. And 
Mark Carney, who was the former Bank of Canada governor and the Bank of England governor, is a big believer as well in the whole transition exercise. Oh, that's interesting, especially just from not just turning a blind eye and completely walking away. You're, you're, you guys are involved in actually trying to help make change for the better. So that's, that's interesting. How can people even just start to become a responsible investor? There are just so many responsible solutions out there right now. Product choice, which was also an objection along with performance way back when, is no longer an issue. Everybody's getting into the game and we welcome that. For the longest time at NEI, we were the only game in town and we kind of walked around in the wilderness for a while until the world really started to get interested in this. And, and so we, we welcome that interest. We do caution investors to really look at the funds that they are invested in. There are funds out there that are RI in name only. There are funds that only apply a very small subset of responsible investment approaches to them. All we encourage investors to do, whether they're buying one of our products or buying the products of one of our competitors, is to look under the hood uh, and make sure that you are getting what you think you're getting because it may not, it, it may be a little different when you actually look in terms of how the fund operates. And secondly, to talk to an advisor, working with an advisor together, an advisor who many of whom know the asset managers and the fund companies better than, and than a regular investor might, you can kind of work through that process and decide what is it you're really trying to do. And my, my big thing lately is I think that people want to invest responsibly because they really want responsible investing to help them empower their purpose and responsible investing can do that. But unless you have that conversation with an advisor and you say, say, these are the kind of things I'm interested in doing. This is the kind of difference I'm interested in making. You could end up in any fund. And by having that conversation, you can be directed to the kind of investment that is really aligned with your purpose and your beliefs. I have many clients over the years because uh, I've been involved in putting people in ESG funds for quite a few years now. And over the years, it doesn't have to be a hundred percent or nothing. I have some clients that have approached me and have said, I want a hundred percent of my portfolio to be an ESG funds, responsible investing. No, I don't want to dime anywhere else. And we've done that. But I also have a lot of clients where they're, they want to start going down that road and they say, let's just do 10%, 20%, or let's just exclude a few things I'm not really interested in, such as maybe one of them could have been fossil fuels. So it doesn't have to be 100%, you're gonna change your portfolio right off the hop. I have had clients where they just start dabbling in it and get used to it, seeing that the performance is on par with everything else and just kind of just starting to go down that route as opposed to just flipping the switch. The interesting thing too over the years is, you'll get new clients in and they'll volunteer, they'll donate to charities, they recycle, but meanwhile, they have no idea what they're invested in. And they just never thought to really kind of ask. They just brought their money to an institution, let's invest it, and just never thought that I'm very big into eating organic foods and I research every food that goes into my body to make sure there's no pesticides or anything like that. But then they never think to like you mentioned, David, to look under the hood of their investments to see exactly what they're invested in to make sure that they are in align with their values. So I definitely agree with that. Yeah, it's a, it's a great example. If you could take as much time as you do reading the label at the organic food store on the tomato sauce that you're buying for your pasta that night and apply that effort into looking into you know what you're invested in, I think you'll just be just fine and you'll land in the kind of investment that's right for you. But you do need to do the work. Okay, Patrice, so you are usually the timekeeper for these, so I'm assuming that we're getting towards the end of this episode? We are. We are indeed. So I'll just mention to our listeners, you've heard the Capital One commercial line of asking, what's in your wallet? I think we should all agree that after this episode, we should be asking, what's in your portfolio? So if anyone has any questions in regards to anything we discussed today, or you would, as David mentioned, like to have us look under the hood, let us know, and you can contact us through our website which is threehatsfinancial.ca. Well wrapped up there, Chris. Chris Duro of Three Hats Financial with David Rutherford of NEI Investments. To subscribe to additional episodes of The Ride, Life, Work, and Wealth, tap the subscribe button on this page. And you can also share with the share button. I'm Patrice Sikora, and let's talk again later. 
Thank you for listening to The Ride, Life, Work, and Wealth Podcast. Click the subscribe button below to be notified when new episodes become available. All comments are of a general nature and should not be relied upon as individual advice. The views and opinions expressed in this commentary may not necessarily reflect those of IPC Investment Corporation. While every attempt is made to ensure accuracy, facts and figures are not guaranteed. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service provider with any questions you may have regarding your investment planning.